Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We're going to pick it up today, Psalm 93, verse 1, which actually you could think of Psalm 93 as a continuation of Psalm 92 concerning uh, the true Sabbath. And and I want you to, to, to get outside of the box, if you will, a little bit in your thinking. When I say Sabbath, I don't want you thinking of a single day of the week. Uh, that's not the Sabbath we're talking about here anyway. What we're talking about, the Sabbath, is the Lord's Day. And we're talking about the 1,000-year period that Messiah will reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords here on earth. Actually, he'll reign forever after that. But when he returns at the second advent, we have that thousand year period referred to as the millennium. Um, some of you know it as. It's also referred to as the Lord's day. One day with the Lord is as a thousand years, a thousand years as one day. Second Peter uh, chapter 3 verse 8. And this group of psalms that we're covering has to do with the earth and rest or peace, you could think of it, desired, but the fact that there will be no rest or peace until the wicked cease troubling the earth. So we're going to see that in this group of psalms as well. Now Psalm 93, 97, and 99 are all tied together as each of those begins with the same phrase, the Lord reigneth. And each of them also, the last verse of each of those psalms, ends with the thought of holiness. So uh, keep that in mind as we work our way through this next set. So with that introduction, let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Psalm 93, verse 1, and it reads, The Lord reigneth. He is clothed with majesty. There, there's no crown of thorns on his head this time. He's not coming back this time as a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. He's coming back on a white war horse with a rod of iron and there will be correction. But rather than a crown of thorns, all the crowns of the world, all nations in other words, will be melted into one crown and that will be worn by Jesus Christ. This is a specific time that we're talking about here. When the Lord reigneth, when is that? That's when he returns at the second advent. The Lord is clothed with his strength, wherewith he hath girded himself. The world also is established that it cannot be moved. And as you many of you know from uh, Jeremiah chapter 4, the Lord shook the earth once already, and it tottered. And, and as is written in Hebrews chapter 29, oh, along about verses 25, 26, 27, he's going to shake it again, uh, again, but this time it won't just be the earth that he shakes, it will be heaven and earth. And and you know, that shaking, it, it changed the earth. If you, you may or may not know it, but the, if you're a pilot, you know that when you're plotting a course uh, of where you need, what heading, what magnetic uh, compass heading you need to take to, to go from point A to point B, you have to allow for the fact that there is a difference between true north and magnetic north. And you have to make adjustments for that or you're not going to end up at point B. You might end up at point C instead of point B. But, uh, and that happened when God shook the earth. The, the, the jet streams that cause severe weather patterns, uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, etc. All of that came about after the Lord shook the earth. And we know from Revelation chapter 21 
verse 1 that there's going to be a new earth when God's throne returns and the earth will be rejuvenated. No more will it totter uh, because of the uh, shaking that God put on the earth. Verse 2, thy throne, referring to Messiah, is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. And I'll add to that, he's also to everlasting. He was the same yesterday. He's the same today. He will be the same tomorrow. And in Psalm 90, verse 4, we learned that for a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past and as a watch in the night. Uh, time is really insignificant to the Lord. You know, we think, tend to think that our time here in the flesh is such a long period of time. When you consider it, though, compared to the eternity, the time that we're here in the flesh on earth is but the blink of an eye. Uh, again, time means nothing uh, to the Lord. Verse 3, The floods have lifted up, O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their waves. And, you know, this could, you can go several directions with this verse. The floods, if you consider them as the firmament that God placed around the earth in Genesis chapter 1 is what I'm talking about, those of you who aren't familiar. But uh, the, the earth was watered by that firmament. And... Uh, of course, that firmament was destroyed at a later point in time, but it will be uh, placed back in place. The floods, we also learn in, in Revelation chapter 17, verse 15, what, what are the waters in the symbology of the book of Revelation? They're peoples. And, and no matter how uh, the, the raging of the floods, the people, if we will, the world, the people, uh, will not be able to hinder God's kingdom. And that, I couldn't help but think about uh, the second psalm, uh, verse 1 and 2. Why do the heathen rage? Uh, why do they uh, consider a vain thing? Why do they think they can take counsel against God Almighty and His anointed? They're wasting their time. They're not going to uh, stop the kingdom of God from coming in. Verse 4, the Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters, yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. The nations of the earth think that they are mighty, but when they see uh, how mighty our Heavenly Father is, uh, they're going to know that their strength is nothing uh, compared to the strength of the Almighty. Verse 5, the testimonies, this being the law and promises of our Heavenly Father, are very sure. You can take them to the bank. Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. And that's the way it will be in the eternity. It's written in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 20 and 21, that everything in the Lord's house at that point in time will be holy. And, you know, some of you will qualify for that in that you will be the elect who have participated in the first resurrection of, of Revelation chapter 20, verses 5 and 6. And, and as it's written in Revelation 24, you will reign with Christ a thousand years. So you will be in his house as well. Can you imagine what a, what a privilege and an honor that is? That uh, is something really to work for at this point in time. Psalm 94, we continue with the prayer for rest uh, for the earth. That's the, the theme, if you will. And, you know, when our Heavenly Father uh, reigns, there will be rest and peace on earth. But again, uh, our theme here is that there will be no rest or peace for the earth until uh, the Messiah returns at the second advent. That's why he's called the Prince of Peace, if you will. Psalm 94, verse 1. Let's go with it. 
O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongeth, O God, to whom vengeance belongeth, show thyself. In other words, shine forth. And, and again, they'll have, we'll have no true Sabbath, no true peace until this occurs, when he shines forth, when he returns at the second advent. That is time also that, uh, that as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 35, and also in the Minor Prophets, in Nahum chapter 1, verse 2, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, quoting those two verses there. And that vengeance, that cup of wrath, of God's wrath, will be poured out by Jesus Christ, excuse me, when he returns at the second advent. <clears throat> no peace for earth until that happens. Verse 2, lift up thyself, thou judge of the earth. And here, uh, uh, keeping with our theme of the, this relating to earth, we see here, thou judge of the earth. And there is only one. Render a reward to the proud. And the proud, including Satan, remember that's his uh, downfall, Ezekiel chapter 28. He got all puffed up in himself. He, he got off on an ego trip and thought he should be sitting on the mercy seat rather than being a cherub that protects the mercy seat. But yeah, the reward have, the, the proud have a reward. I don't think it's the reward that they're looking for though. Uh, God does not like proud people. The point is, is to humble yourself. Christ taught in the New Testament on numerous occasions that if you exalt yourself, that God will abase you. He'll humble you. He'll bring you down a notch or two. But if you'll humble yourself, God will exalt you. Verse 3, Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? It just seems like every time I turn around, I see someone who is doing wicked and evil things, and it appears that they're prospering. It appears that they, they, they're wearing the nicest clothes, that they drive the nicest car. Uh, and it, how long is that going to, uh, that's not consistent with what your word says is going to happen to the wicked. How long will that continue? And the prayer here of the psalmist is for uh, complete revenge and recompense on the wicked. That day will come, verse 4. How long shall they utter and speak hard things? This means uh, arrogant things or, or impudent things. And all the workers of iniquity boast themselves. They build themselves up and, and most often at the expense of others. Have you ever known anyone like that? that uh, about the only thing that comes out of their mouth is boasts of how great they are. And again, oftentimes that's at the expense of others. Be humble. Verse 5, They break in pieces thy people, O Lord, and afflict thine heritage. His heritage is you, beloved. And, and how do the, the, the wicked today break his people in pieces, well, through false teaching is one way. Uh, that falls into the category of one of the four hidden dynasties. Religion, one of the four hidden dynasties that will be used to break God's inheritance in pieces, or at least they will try and break you in pieces. We have another aspect of that four hidden dynasties, the economy. Uh, usury is so out of control that that breaks God's people in pieces. If you uh, get involved in it, and today people go out and buy a house and make payments on it for 30 years, and at the end, yeah, they've got the house finally paid for, but they've paid three or four times what the original purchase price of the house was. And if you get one of these plastic uh, credit cards and you're paying 20 to 25 percent interest on that, 
that will break you in pieces as well because if you make the minimum payment on that piece of plastic each month, you'll never get it paid off with a 20 to 25 percent uh, uh, interest rate. So, and, but you know, you don't have to put up with the evil and the wicked uh, breaking you in pieces. Uh, God gave us power over all of our enemies, Luke chapter 10, verses 17, 18, and 19, in the name of Jesus Christ. So uh, use the gray matter that God put between your head, but also uh, order things away from you that are negative and wicked in the name of Jesus Christ. Verse 6, they slay the widow, continuing about the wicked and the evil. They slay the widow and the stranger, that being a foreigner, and murder the fatherless, the fatherless being the orphans. So in other words, those who are unable or won't uh, stand up for themselves, the wicked and the evil run over them and to slay them. Uh, you could think of this not necessarily as uh, physically murdering them, but uh, leading them to a spiritual uh, death, if you will, which is uh, what many people are under right now because of all the false teaching. But uh, the oppressors are bloodthirsty and blasphemous is the point. Um, they oppress God's people and uh, using spiritual deception, uh, they cause them to, to fall into spiritual death. Verse 7. Yet they, this being the wicked, say, The Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. <clears throat> you know, we haven't heard from God in a while. We, we haven't seen God for a while. Uh, you know what? I just don't think he cares anymore. Wrong. He keeps very good records. And there comes a day when the wicked will be judged those books will be opened up as it's written of the white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20. And everyone will be judged according to their work. So uh, if you think you're getting away with something because God has turned his way or lost his attention or is no longer interested in what's going on, on earth, uh, you're in for a rude awakening on judgment day. Verse 8. Understand ye brutish among the people, and ye fools, when will ye be wise? Brutish is, uh, actually means stupid, but, but also it means behavior that you would expect uh, from a beast, an animal. And, and in other words, it's, it's, there's no spiritual uh, aspect about it. It's carnal, flesh. Only, you know, where a cow, for example, she's, she's worried about where can I find some water to drink? Uh, where can I find some feed to eat? And that's what brutish you could think about here. They have, n there's not a spiritual bone in their body, in other words. When will ye be wise, ye fools? And in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, we learn that the fear or the reverence of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge and wisdom. So how do they gain wisdom? By starting to fear and revere the Lord rather than saying uh, he doesn't see, he doesn't hear what's going on. Verse 9, he that planted the ear, in other words, God who placed the ear where he put it, shall he not hear? Question. He that formed the eye, shall he not see? Of course your heavenly Father hears and sees. In fact is, he gives us ears to hear and eyes to see as well. If he's given you ears to hear and eyes to see, don't ever forget to thank him. Verse 10, He that chastiseth the heathen, or the nations, you could translate, shall not he correct? Question, he that teacheth man knowledge, shall not he know? All knowledge, all true knowledge and wisdom comes from our Heavenly Father. I mentioned Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 just a moment ago, that 
the, the beginning, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge. That verse ends with, but fools despise instruction. And this verse tells us that God will teach us knowledge. The question is, are we willing to learn? Do, do we have time to learn? And, and, and you mean God will sit down with me and teach me? You better believe he will through his Holy Spirit, through the letter that he wrote to you, his word. Uh, he teaches. The question is, again, are you willing to learn? Verse 11, The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man, that they are vanity. And without uh, God in our lives, our thoughts are basically vain. That means empty or nothing. That previous verse, too, that God chasteneth the heathen and the nations. And you know what? Those who God chastens should be thankful. Why? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, we learn that God only chastens those that he loves. So if he's chastened you recently, that means he loves you. And uh, therefore, you should kiss the paddle, say, thank you, Lord, and get on with your life and serving your heavenly Father. Verse 12, Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest. Happy is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law and out of his word, in other words. And uh, the question, are you taught? Are you willing to learn? Because as we concluded that Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, fools despise instruction. So, you know, someone who isn't willing to learn from God's teaching, I don't know what other category you could put them in other than that they are a fool. Verse 13, that thou mayest give him rest. Here we go with the Sabbath, the peace again from the days of adversity until the pit be digged for the wicked. And oh boy, is that verse full. The pit that's going to be dug for the wicked, that's the abyss of Revelation chapter 20, verses 1, 2, and 3. Now notice that at the end of verse 12, there wasn't a period. There, there was a semicolon there. It wasn't the end of the thought. So let's go back and tie the two together once. Blessed or happy is the man whom thou, referring to the Lord, chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law, that thou mayest give him rest from the days of adversity. Now I tell you, we have some days of adversity in our future. In fact, our adversary will be here on earth as Antichrist claiming to be Jesus Christ. Now, if you are willing to let the Lord teach you out of his law, then you may, he may give you rest from the days of adversity. And if you know God's word, you know what's going to happen. And, and there's nothing to get all shook up about. There's nothing to fear because you know God's in control. You know that if you learn his law, that he'll give you rest from the days of adversity. He's that place of refuge, if you will, that we've been talking about, that, that tabernacle that no matter how bad things get, you can escape and go into that tabernacle. I'm talking about your relationship with your heavenly Father, not a, a, a building that, that the hands of man put together. That place of refuge where you have his wall of protection around you. There is nothing, absolutely nothing to fear. Satan is going into that abyss. At the end of that thousand years, he will be loosed again for a short period of time, uh, then his sentence is carried out. You, know, you mean Satan has already been sentenced from the white throne judgment? Yes, he has. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18 and 19. He's going to be turned to ashes from within. I look forward to that day. 
Verse 14, For the Lord will not cast off his people, neither will he forsake his inheritance. And his inheritance, we can think about his uh, first fruits, those who participate in the first resurrection, those, of course, being his election. Verse 15, But judgment shall return unto righteousness, and all the upright in heart shall follow it, joyously greeting the long-awaited justice of God. And I don't know about you, but I look forward to that justice returning. You look around today and, and you see uh, laws being passed in our great land that, that, that legalize perversity. And we take what's wrong and make it right and what's right and make it wrong. And that's going to stop. When, when, our, when is that going to stop? I can tell you when it's going to stop when these days that we're talking about here, this day, better said, the Lord's day comes to pass. Uh, he's coming back, and again, not as a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. He's coming back on a white war horse with a rod of iron for chastisement and correction, and things will be straightened out. I say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Verse 16. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers, the, the thoughts of Messiah? Or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Before he returns, there's a group of people who will stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ. They're called his election, and the Holy Spirit will speak through them and witness against the Antichrist, Satan, who will be here on earth claiming to be Jesus Christ. The election will stand up for him against the workers of iniquity. And you know, we are uh, taking a stand even today. Uh, we're not second-class citizens. Christians are not second-class citizens, and we have rights just like everyone else in exercising your vote uh, your freedoms of speech. Uh, we are taking names and kicking dragon even today. Verse 17. Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul had almost dwelt in silence. And if the Lord had not been my help, I might as well have curled up and died and been placed in the grave. Verse 18. When I said, My foot slippeth, thy mercy, O Lord, held me up. When it appeared that I was falling, your, your mercy held me up. This reminded me of a previous psalm, Psalm 63, verse 8, where it's talking that about those who love the Lord follow hard after Him. In other words, they focus on Him. And, and if, like an infant... They, they start to totter like a two-year-old, uh, one-and-a-half, two-year-old as they're learning to walk. Uh, they teeter and they totter this way and that way. And, and, and just like that parent is right there to, to support them with that right hand to keep them from falling all the way, your Heavenly Father is there for you with that right hand as well to keep you from falling all the way. He loves you. Verse 19, in the multitude of my thoughts, within me thy comforts delight my soul. In other words, when I, I start thinking sad thoughts or, or fearful thoughts, then I am comforted and my soul delights in your comforts. And I couldn't help but think about John chapter 14 when uh, Jesus was preparing the disciples for the fact that he was going to be leaving. But he said, you know, I won't leave you comfortless. I'm going to pray to the Father and he will leave you the comforter. That is, of course, the Holy Spirit. I hope you know his comfort and it delights your soul. Verse 20. Shall the throne of iniquity 
have fellowship with thee which frameth mischief by a law. Now the throne of the iniquity, the throne of sin or wickedness is the throne of Satan. And it has absolutely no fellowship with the throne of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Uh, there's enmity or, or separation and difference between the two thrones. Psalm 91, we learn how Satan frameth mischief. Uh, one thing that he does, he twists God's word. Uh, he, he adds a few words here or takes a few words there to, to completely change the meaning of God's word. He's a scripture lawyer. Verse 21, they gather themselves together against the soul of the righteous and condemn the innocent blood. And of course the innocent blood, that of Jesus Christ, he was completely innocent. But note this, they gather themselves together against, does it say the flesh? No, the soul of the righteous. And and that's you if you love and serve the Lord. But you know what? So what? Let me ask you this. Do any of them have the power to condemn your soul to the second death? No, they don't have that power. There's only one entity that has that power. We learn about him in Matthew uh, chapter 10, verse 28, where we learn that fear not them who can slay your flesh body, fear he who can destroy your flesh and your soul in hell. And that is only one entity, your heavenly Father. So what if they condemn you? Uh, who cares? They don't have the power to back it up. Verse 22, but the Lord is my defense. He's my refuge. He's my, my sanctuary. And my God is the rock of my refuge. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. If God be for us, who can be against us? And the teachings of Paul there. And the answer is, of course, no one can be against us because there is no more powerful entity in the universe than your heavenly Father. And when he's serving as a wall of protection around you, you have absolutely nothing to fear. Verse 23 to conclude the psalm. And he, this is Yahweh, the, the Lord in verse 1, uh, whom vengeance belongeth to. He shall bring upon them their own iniquity. He's going to bring uh, what they were going to bring upon you on their own heads and shall cut them off in their own wickedness. Yea, the Lord our God shall cut them off. So the wicked won't continue to triumph. The, the wicked won't prosper forever. As we learned in that acrostic psalm, Psalm 37, in verses 7, 20, and 34, the wicked don't get ahead. They go into the lake of fire. And the righteous, the Zadok, the elect, will be, uh, earn the right to be there to watch when Satan and those who follow him go into that lake of fire. So no rest for the earth until the King of Peace returns. That, of course, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ at the second advent. We'll come back and continue our study in these, uh, the Psalms concerning and relating to the earth and peace and rest for the earth in our next lecture. We've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. 
The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, the U.S., and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to be answered on the air, feel free to call that 800 number and leave your question. We do ask that you not ask questions about a specific individual, denomination, or organization by name. Uh, we teach God's Word in a positive format, throwing out negative about others by name serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. If you're listening by shortwave radio or studying via the internet somewhere around the world that can't use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in being the point. Got a prayer request? We can do away with the telephone number. You don't need a phone. You don't need paper and pencil and a mailing address. Your Heavenly Father is there for you 24-7. I encourage you to go to Him. You know, I don't think you have a lot of competition these days. It seems like we live in a, a particularly uh, evil, wicked generation. Uh, everyone's so busy in the ways of the world, they don't have time for God. And when you make time to talk to Him, it makes His day, beloved. And uh, when you make his day, he's going to make yours, and I'm talking about blessings. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to look upon these, Father. You know their needs, uh, illnesses, uh, troubled marriages, Father. We ask you, if you, is your will a special blessing on each of these? And we also remember our military troops who are in harm's way around the world. Father, we ask you to watch over, guide, direct, protect, touch, heal, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and thank you, Father. <clears throat> Let's get to some questions. First up today, we have Rick from Florida. And thank you for your kind comments and particularly for remembering the staff. We have a, a very hard working group of people here at the chapel that get a, a fantastic amount of work done. Uh, both our, our volunteers who volunteer to help and our paid staff, uh, we're just very blessed with those that are, that are helping to get the word out. Question, while studying in Psalms with Dennis, I have heard Pastor Arnold and Dennis say many times that the only thing you can take with you are your works, good, bad, and ugly. But if we repent, are there still bad and ugly works that go with us? I know we will be judged on our works. Are our works in the book of life? I believe that's how I understand it. Well, when you repent uh, of your sins, the, the bad and ugly things that we were just talking about, they're blotted out. It's, it means, the word means, that it's just like taking an eraser and erasing something that was written in pencil. It's not there anymore. And, and so, of course, when you're judged on your works, you're judged for the good things that you've done, your righteous acts, and any sins that you have not repented of. What's the key? Uh, with a sincere, sincere heart, uh, repent often. Because we all fall short. We all mess up. And you're right, the great white throne judgment of Revelation chapter 20 verses 11 and 12, it states there that the books, plural, are opened up and were judged by our works. Also, they opened another book there. So it's not the same book, but another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead, and we're talking about the spiritually dead who did not take part in the first resurrection, were judged by those things which were written in the books. And something that you want to work for right now is make sure that you're not among those dead in the first place. Because if you're one of his elect, you've already taken part in the first resurrection when the white throne judgment occurs meaning that the second death 
the death of the soul has no power over you at that point. In other words, you're good to go into the eternity. Michael from Oklahoma. Okay, let me get down to your question and thank you for your comments. I have a question. Where is it in the Bible that talks about the child to be cut in half by King Solomon? And thank you and God bless you, Pastor Dennis and the staff. Well, thank you again for that and God bless you, Michael. And that you'll find in 1 Kings uh, chapter 3. Now, the first part of 1 Kings uh, chapter 3, God appeared to Solomon in a dream. And he told Solomon, you ask what you will of me and I'll give it to you. And Solomon asked for wisdom that he could uh, rule such a, such a wonderful people as God's children Israel. And God was pleased with that because Solomon didn't ask for things for himself, wealth or longevity or whatever. He asked for something to help the people that he would rule. And this event that you're talking about, Michael, uh, where there were two women and each of them had a son. And the one uh, probably slept, fell asleep on the child and suffocated it. But then the next day, rather than saying, oh, I've lost my child, she tried to steal the other woman's child and say, you know, give me my child, here's your son. And of course that got word to Solomon. Uh, he summons them and had them bring the child to him. And he ordered, well, after talking with them and couldn't come to a conclusion, he said, bring me my sword so that I can cut the child in half and I'll give one half to one woman and one half to the other woman. And of course he had no intention of doing that, but he knew that the real mother, rather than losing her son, would give him up and let the other woman take him, which is exactly what happened. And that proved that God had indeed uh, blessed Solomon with uncanny wisdom uh, for which he could, with which he could rule over Israel. Solomon, one of the wisest of all, and that's why we can gather so much from uh, the books that he's responsible for, uh, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Ray in New York, uh, my question concerns Mount Zion. I can't find it on the geographical map in the back of my Bible. Is Mount Zion a spiritual place or a real mount? Please respond and help me to understand. Mount Zion is a very real physical location. And uh, I don't know, I'm not familiar with what kind of Bible you have, but uh, if you obtain any uh, uh, atlas of Bible lands or a book of that nature that has maps, you'll find Mount Zion uh, for sure, as well as Mount Moriah and the Mount of Olives, if you will, the same. Brenda in Mississippi, uh, I was watching your brother's program on October 10th, 2013. I think you actually mean I was watching your son's program because Arnold Murray and Dennis Murray aren't brothers, although the more gray I get up on top, the more people think that we're brothers, but actually Arnold Murray is the father, Dennis Murray, myself, is the son, irregardless. And he spoke of a person who was on drugs and God could not use them. Oh, please tell me God will use me. I love God with all my heart, soul, and mind. I want my, in, I don't know, I want my eternity, that's what this is, to be with God. I take prescription drugs because of an injury to my shoulder blade in 2004 and I need to go no further without explaining to you that you misunderstood, Brenda. Uh, we're not talking, when we talk about someone who uses drugs, we're talking about illegal drugs. Uh, when your doctor prescribes medications for you to take, you definitely want to follow your doctor's orders. and. Uh, God understands when you are given a condition or a disability 
that requires medication and he's not going to allow anything to happen to you but always follow doctor's orders when I, when you heard me say that I was talking about people who are on illegal drugs for example Jerry in Texas we say grace at restaurants when we eat there should we not do that we do it because we're thankful not for all the people to see. Thank you and your staff and all you do. And thanks for uh, remembering the staff as well. I think I know what you're talking about. In Matthew chapter 6, the disciples are asking Jesus, how should we pray? And he tells them, you know, don't uh, pray, and stand, don't be like the hypocrites and, and stand up to be seen and heard in the churches or out on the corner of the street to be seen of men, but rather go into your closet, meaning a quiet place, and pray. But there's absolutely nothing wrong, Jerry, with asking God, and, and I love it when I see uh, families at, at a restaurant that, that they join hands and, and say grace over their food. They, they don't care. If, if what the other people in the restaurant think about because their relationship with their Heavenly Father is a lot more important than relationships with other men. So uh, you feel free to say grace over your food and, 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 and don't worry about what other people think about it. And don't worry that you're going to offend God because you're doing it in a public place. He knows your heart. He knows your mind and that you're not doing it to be seen of men. <clears throat> Julia in Texas, uh, thank you for your comments. My question in Revelation chapter 11, verses 2 and 3, um, I am not getting the months and days in these verses. Is this where the days are shortened or just the days that the two witnesses will be on earth. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I hope you will answer my question on the air. I will be watching, okay? And I, I hope you see the answer, Julia. The days you're talking about in Revelation chapter 11, uh, verses two and three, are the days that the two witnesses will be here on earth. And if you compare that to uh, uh, Revelation uh, chapter, what is it, 13, you'll find there that the days of the, the Antichrist are 42 months. Prophecy of Satan always in moons or months. Prophecy of God's workers, children, the two witnesses definitely falling into that court category, always in days where we're children of light. But now that period that's mentioned there in Revelation 11 and 13 has been shortened and Jesus shortened the period of time for the elect's sake as it's written in, in the book of Matthew. But <clears throat> I, and, and will it be uh, a same number of days, 10 days? No, I think it will more likely be proportional. In other words, if you take 10 days longer than 42 months, and then that period of time has been shortened to five months, as we learn in Revelation chapter 9, I think the two witnesses will be here a proportional number of days, maybe two days uh, or one day before the Antichrist. But I think they'll be here before because they're going to be hooking up with God's elect to get them prepared for what's about to happen. Joyce in Oklahoma which, apostle, uh, which apostles were at Jesus' crucifixion? Why weren't they all there? Well, the only one I can think of was there uh, that we can document was John. And in uh, John, the book of the Gospel, 19, verses 26 and 27, as Christ was being crucified and was already hung on the cross, he looked and he saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, not mentioned by name, but uh, we know that the disciple that Jesus loved was John, the writer of the gospel. And he saith unto his mother, 
woman, behold thy son. And then in verse 27, he said to the disciple, behold thy mother. And from that hour, the disciple took uh, Mary into his own home. Walter in Canada, why weren't the rest of them there? Because they were running scared, uh, would be my thought. Walter in Canada, I have a question. My wife and I want to be cremated. What does the Bible say about it? And there's nothing wrong with cremation. Uh, Saul and two or three of his sons uh, that were killed in battle were cremated. The last few verses of the book of 1 Samuel will document that. When we're through with these flesh bodies, we're done with them. You're, you're never going back in that flesh body again. And as we learn in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Uh, don't let anyone tell you that you're going to need your flesh body again. Who would want to go through the eternity in a flesh body that gets sick, that gets old? We have something uh, much better. Uh, our spiritual bodies step out of these, uh, and these flesh bodies are wonderful uh, works. God did a fantastic job creating them and we're still man still trying to figure out how everything clicks and ticks as it does in, in the human body. But once we're done with them, uh, we got something much better than this. Susan from Minnesota, in 1 Kings 2015, who are the princes of the provinces? And they were 232. Also in that same verse are the 7,000, the very elect. And yes, the, the well, symbolic of, if you will, the 7,000 very elect. And what's the difference between very elect and elect? Well, there's 144,000 total of elect. And I think that the 7,000 will never bow a knee to uh, the Antichrist and uh, the others, when they see and hear what the 7,000 are saying, actually the Holy Spirit speaking through them, they're going to go, that's truth, and then they get on board. The 232 were, well, they're called princes of the provinces there. Uh, I think that they were leaders, if you will, and does that mean that there are going to be 232 uh, leaders of the 7,000 elect? Uh, there wouldn't uh, be any stretch, I don't think. Rob, this looks like Rob Lynn from Texas. Uh, if we trade gold or silver to somebody who worships Satan to obtain food and such, isn't that the same thing as doing it yourself? No, not at all. And, and what Rob Lynn is talking about here is that God's elect when Antichrist is here, that one world system uh, set up, uh, they won't be able to buy and sell. And we teach people that it's good to have some precious metals on hand so that you can trade for necessities, food, etc. Uh, it doesn't hurt to have some canned food set back uh, for such that, that event when it occurs uh, as well. But the, the, the key about not accepting that money from the one world system uh, is because it is uh, required for you to participate in that system that you worship the Antichrist. And that's the key right there. Don't take the mark of the beast, which means worshiping the Antichrist. And uh, I don't care what means you go about of obtaining food, uh, no problem as long as you don't worship the Antichrist. Francisco in Jamaica, uh, I'd like to know about the Bible dictionary. Is it the same as the Strong's Concordance? No, we, we offer the Strong's Concordance, which that's critical that everyone that studies with the chapel have a Strong's Concordance. It, it, it allows you to take any word in the King James Version Bible back to the original language and uh, through a system of numbers because obviously you don't, uh, you're not fluent in Hebrew and Greek. So through a numbering system, it, it allows you to prove out what the translators did in their works. 
Oftentimes, that adds a lot of meaning to your studies. The Smith's Bible Dictionary that we offer, in my opinion, is one of the better values, uh, bang for your buck, of any of the reference materials we offer other than the Strong's Concordance. And uh, at, at only a $15 donation, it gives you a wealth of information. It comes, by the way, uh, the one that we offer from the original teacher's edition of the Smith's Bible Dictionary, uh, which is, is the better. Mike in Illinois. I think it is in Revelation, but I'm not sure about the Spirit stood up lying to them. And I think you're, you're referring to 1 Kings uh, chapter 22, verse 19 in the following verses. And uh, that's prophecy there. Uh, what happened was Ahab uh, and, and, and the king of Judah were getting ready to go up to war. And the king of Judah uh, said, you know, Ahab, isn't there uh, a man of God that we can inquire of? And they brought up Micaiah, and Micaiah uh, saw the kingdom of God and on God on his throne. And the Lord saying, who will convince Ahab to go up to Ramoth Gilead and fall, in other words, die in battle? And that's when the lying spirit volunteered and said, I'll go forth and I'll become a lying uh, words in the mouth of Kaniah, uh, who was one of the false prophets who were there telling them, go ahead, go up, you'll be successful out of time. I love you all a great deal because you enjoy studying God's word in depth. How do I know that? Because you're still watching this program. You haven't turned the channel. And you know what? When your heavenly father looks down and he sees you with the letter he wrote to you, the Bible open, it makes his day. Blessings will follow. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. Most important, this beloved, you stay in his word every day. Every day in your Father's Word is a good day. Do you know why? It's because Jesus is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.